Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Invisible Not Broken. I'm Eva, your co-host, and I interview practitioners with chronic illnesses. But actually today is a little bit different. I'm interviewing a practitioner, uh, but she doesn't have a chronic illness, but we are going to talk about uh, her experience with her daughter who had one. She is an integrative functional medicine board certified internal medicine physician. Yes, mouthful, but it basically just means that she is the real deal. She is smart, creative, kind, thinks outside the box, and she is so lovely. We hit it off immediately when we met and we weren't even meeting to talk about the podcast, but I, I knew I had to have her on. And as I expected, this was a wonderful episode that I plan on revisiting myself again and again. So sit tight and enjoy my conversation with Dr. Boyana Yankovic Weatherly. Hello, Dr. Boyana. Lovely uh, to have you on the podcast today. I'm so excited. Hi, it's so great to be here. And um, I'm so, so excited for the opportunity to um, chat with you today and, um, and just absolutely love your podcast. I've been listening to it and, and love the, the messages that you're bringing out there to the world. So thank you. Yeah, wow. Thank you for that. That's, that's really wonderful to hear. And I love how when we met, uh, my intention was not actually to bring you onto the podcast. I just wanted to learn more about your work. And then I was like, oh my God, this, she needs to come on. Because <laughs> you're, you're just fabulous in so many ways. Um, but yeah, now let's, let's let everyone else hear why you're fabulous. Uh, so as always, I like to start with, uh, please tell us your story. In this case, it might be a little bit of a different story. Um, in whatever way you'd like to tell it, uh, from your perspective as a physician and, and as a human. Absolutely. Uh, so I'm going to share, uh, my story as it relates to the way that we met and some of the things that we have talked about initially, because, um, I think that, um, one of the reasons why your story really resonated and, um, and this concept of, of having this podcast where you openly talk about, um, you know, your own condition, other people's conditions and experiences, as well as then our experiences as professionals is just so, it's, it's so important and not talked about enough. Um, and I think that unfortunately there's, there's so much judgment still from, from all sides. And, um, and it's really important to kind of let our guard down a little bit and, um, uh, and really be okay with, with, you know, looking within, whether we're looking for answers for ourselves, um, whether uh, we're looking to help others, because I think that that just amplifies our effect on ourselves, our health, on the world, on the people that we touch and influence. Um, so I'm a board certified internist, as you know, but my path to becoming a fellowship trained uh, integrative medicine doctor and a functional medicine doctor was definitely not a straightforward one. And uh, when I was little, I didn't even really know what integrative and functional medicine um, were, nor that that's something that would just so deeply resonate with the core of my being. Um, but I, you know, like most pre-med students went to medical school. Sorry, I want to rephrase this. <laughs> uh, as my colleagues in uh, pre-med, I went into medical school thinking that I'm gonna change the world, I'm gonna help so many people. Uh, there are all these exciting tools and therapies that we can use um, to help people with certain illnesses and symptoms. And, um, and then going through the medical training and residency training and, and becoming a primary care physician, I found out that clearly I was very naive and there were many conditions. Um, that were considered to be mysteries, where we couldn't find the actual physical um, evidence of what exactly it is that needs to be repaired, or what it is that's malfunctioning. And I found that time and time again, my colleagues and myself would see patients with a constellation of symptoms, whether they're fibromyalgia or chronic fatigue syndrome, or depression or anxiety, or that we just 
couldn't get to the root of it. And unfortunately, pharmaceuticals were being, you know, handed out like candy because there was just no better way that we were trained or, or thought to kind of think about these problems. And I had a big problem with that. Fundamentally, I just was not okay. I didn't feel that um, I could go on practicing like this. I think that there were a lot of very, very, very valuable um, lessons throughout my training. And I'm so happy that I went the way that I did. But I also knew that I needed to look for more answers and, and get more information and really find a deeper way to help my patients by looking at the root cause and then looking at all the evidence-based modalities, some of them which we learn about in medical school and residency training, and some of which we don't learn about. And we have no idea how to use them, when to use them, or even what to expect in terms of results. And what I found was, was the biggest thing as, a, as that door kind of started to open for me is that, that it gave me hope, it gave my patients hope. And I think that's really kind of one of the first things that just sort of opened my eyes and said, okay, you're going on this path, there's no turning back. And one of the things that in, in kind of reflecting back and thinking about, you know, how did I end up in integrative and functional medicine and get to do all these amazing things um, is that I would say it probably starts, you know, probably started in my residency training when I decided in my uh, second year of residency training that I was ready to be a mom. And so I was pregnant and doing um, 30, 35 hour shifts sometimes, working six days a week, um, 60 plus hours a week, uh, doing the best I could to take care of my body and protect my, my growing baby, but not really having very much freedom in how I were to do that because of these hours and because I was taking care of very sick patients. And I loved, loved, loved what I did. But I just reached this point of extreme fatigue, exhaustion, and guilt because I was supposed to be focusing my efforts on, on the one hand, helping people and being a stellar medical resident. And on the other hand, of growing this baby and giving it not only nutrients, but love and support and calm. And I was not, I was anything but calm at that point. <laughs> it's, it's hard during residency. It is. It's a little hard. Um, but at the same time, it was a decision that I'd made. And it was a conscious, conscious decision that I um, take ownership of. And I did the best I could in that situation. So I started taking up prenatal yoga. And that was kind of my first little glimpse of oh, wow, look at what prenatal yoga does to my body and how I can visualize my baby and send my baby these amazing messages and massage the baby. And, and, and it really started to kind of open up this window a little bit of, okay, even in these you know, very um, intense circumstances, we can create an environment for ourselves where we can feel empowered and where we can change the things that we're in control of, right? Because we're always gonna have things that are beyond our control. And in fact, most things are beyond our control, whether it's natural disasters, whether it's our family or friends getting ill, um, beyond our control. Actions of other people, judgments of other people, beyond our control. But we can control how we respond to these experiences and we can control our microenvironment and what we create during our time that's just for us. So again, that was just kind of a tiny little opening. I went on to complete my internal medicine residency, had my second child after that, and started practicing as an internist. And as a mom who just started this practice as part of a medical group, I felt very much torn again. On the one hand, I was leaving my babies at home that needed me after about three months of mat leave. Um, each time and feeling this immense guilt and literally crying, like driving to work and crying every morning, I would say for at least a, a couple of months. Um, again, I still loved what I do. I was so, felt so lucky to be, I'm an internist. I get to do primary care. I actually get to help people, but I'm leaving these two babies at home. And I think that that kind of 
maybe, I don't know if I should call it disconnect or kind of these competing needs and desires and, and wanting to be everything to any, everyone um, and wanting to do the best job that I possibly can in all these different areas of my life, I think ultimately just um, drove me towards um, burnout and to this kind of state of um, a lack of joy and hopelessness that we that we talked about just before we started recording, I think. Um, and that was a very, very difficult time. And I think it's interesting because especially as, again, as a physician and also the culture that I was brought up in, I'm originally Serbian and we immigrated to Canada when I was 13, but the culture there was brought up in and then the, the, my professional culture, I felt very much like, nope, I'm not supposed to feel this way. Resist, 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 just keep working, keep doing this thing and keep doing. And I think that to the outside world, I don't think it was apparent at all what was going on inside, but inside it was just kind of like this, this whole, um, uh, um, I would say sense of overwhelm and emotions that just, um, as much as I was trying to suppress and say, well, this is what life is. You're always going to have these competing needs and, and you're always going to feel torn. I, I really wasn't addressing them properly. Um, and so ultimately it just led to more and more anxiety and, and more and more of a depressed mood because how can you feel joy and how can you feel the rewards of all the amazing things that are happening if you're so torn inside and not really addressing these things? And then of course I felt incredibly guilty for feeling that way on top of everything else and very judgmental of myself because, uh, you know, how could I, a, a mom of these two beautiful children, um, a wife, uh, a doctor, what, what is there to complain about? How could I possibly have anything, you know? And so I think that working through that guilt and all of those emotions kind of, again, really started to help me see the other, you know, the other side. And, and what kind of the, that turning point, because I think we all have our turning points in our lives or in conditions that we have or symptoms or, um, or professional trajectories, wherever, whatever it is, that turning point really happened when I, um, I was already kind of, I, I had known about Dr. Andrew Weil and about the Integrative Medicine Center at the University of Arizona, where I subsequently completed my Integrative Medicine Fellowship. I was kind of, you know, reading some articles and looking him up, and I saw that he was giving a talk at the Chopra Center um, at a meditation, at a four-day meditation retreat, um, that was rooted in Ayurveda and Ayurvedic practices. Now at the time, keep in mind, I had no idea what Ayurveda was. And, and for listeners that may not know, it's, um, it's a system of healing that originated from India that's uh, over 5,000 years old. Very intuitive, very interesting how we can combine that with some of the modern modalities and some of the other systems of healing to really um, help people understand their conditions and adapt to their imbalances. But anyways... I thought, okay, well, this sounds like something that, that, that might work. Um, I had never meditated before. I had never done any of this. And I signed up for this four-day meditation retreat with a friend of mine. And it was a completely transformative experience. Um, my first meditation, I just started. This, it was a huge release. Um, when I got my mantra, it just tears started going down. And I kept saying the mantra over and over and over again. And, um, and being able to, even though it was a very short period of time, but carve out a little bit of time to just focus on what's happening inside without judgment and by being very present with myself, um, it just resulted in this complete transformation of how I saw my circumstances, myself, my patients, really, most importantly, for my profession, my patients, it completely transformed the relationships that I had with my patients from that point forward. And it also changed for me how I saw myself as a, as a mom and, 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 um, and in, in just relating to people that are close to me. 
And from that point, even though I didn't really know exactly how or when, I knew that my professional trajectory was changing. And I knew that while I celebrated everything that was part of my training and wanted to maintain that, I also knew that I needed more, that it just was not enough. And it felt incredibly empowering. It gave me that hope. And I think that that hope was that first step in me help me helping really myself discover what I really wanted. In these Chopra Center meditations, actually, the way they start, and we can kind of get into meditation and mindfulness-based stress reduction a little bit more and kind of geek out on the studies later if you want. Um, but I remember um, the questions were, who am I? What do I want? And what is my purpose? And each time, the answer to that can be different. And it's not meant to... Um, again, bring out this, this judgy side, but to really challenge in a more spiritual, holistic way. Well, who am I really? We, we all have multiple roles, but we also identify with certain things. Well, we know that we certainly shouldn't identify with our illness. We may be a person that struggled with that or a person that has this, but we're not our illness. We're not our profession even. We're not our one singular role, the single most important role that we have in life. We're so, so, so much more than that. And I think that recognizing and, and truly believing that and then starting to think about the purpose at a greater level, rather than it being so micro for me, for instance, as in my purpose is to be a primary care physician and do this, it really was my purpose is to help people heal. And at that point, Again, I didn't know how I was going to change that trajectory or what exactly I was going to do, but I knew that whatever I did to help people heal, that I was following my purpose. So whether it was my patients, my family members, my loved ones, my friends, that that was my purpose. And as long as I live every single day in that purpose, that that brought that sense of joy. So that was kind of just to share like that, that turning point and that pivot. And, um, and then from then on to continue the story, I completed the integrative medicine fellowship program, which again was another professionally altering experience. Um, met some wonderful, wonderful physicians and practitioners and um, subsequently started my path with the Institute of Functional Medicine and their training modules. Um, have worked with a number of incredible mentors and really most importantly have been open to learning so much more from my patients because ultimately every every patient that comes in every person that comes in through the door through the door they're the expert in their condition their their body is not reading a textbook um, so yes it's my job to offer the evidence-based tools it's my job to do no harm. It's my job to educate them and empower them about what we do know is happening, to identify the triggers, but they're still the expert. And I think that recognizing that and having, and having patience with the process, again, just completely transformed the way, that I, um, the, way, the way that I saw my role and the way that I saw my contribution and I think the value of that contribution. It's wonderful to hear uh, about the, the, the genuine shift in perception of care, who you are mm -hmm. as a doctor and who patients are as people, um, mm -hmm. and, and then therefore transferring, um, or I guess going through a transformation, as you said, um, mm -hmm. personally and professionally, and then kind of bestowing that on your patients. Um, I would say, uh, something you said at the beginning, um, hope, mm -hmm. uh, I wrote <laughs> in my notes, I wrote it in big letters and mm -hmm. underlined it. I don't know why, not like I would forget that word, uh, but it just really stood out to me because I think that's, that's something we all long for, whether that be because of our chronic conditions or just in life. Um, we all mm -hmm. have moments where we really hope for something and hope is what keeps the door open uh, yes. to 
to possibility. And, mm -hmm. um, and it's something we should all have, hopefully, and, and I guess we should try as much as possible with a positive um, air around it rather than like hope, like hope because I can't imagine anything worse. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I'm saying that correctly. Uh, yeah. And, I see you. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, so really thank you for talking about that uh, in relation to yourself as, as well as what you, what you want to do for your patients, because we really, we really need that. <laughs> knowing and knowing that uh, practitioners like yourself really feel that way, making sure it's conveyed to the patient, mm -hmm. um, that it's, that uh, it's there for them. Uh, and I think a lot of the time, you know, what's, what's really interesting is that um, what I've observed in myself and my colleagues is that we go into medicine because a lot of, like a lot of our personalities are very OCD and we want to know everything and understand everything and, and master it and figure it out and give answers. And so when we don't find those answers, it's really like, it, it, it's hard, like it, it, it kind of, there's this discrepancy because we're not accepting of it. And so a lot of the times what I will hear, and I'm sure that I have done the same thing again before my eyes opened to possibilities and to, is that, okay, well, you know, your blood work is normal. Your imaging studies are normal or whatever workup we might've done. So everything seems fine. <laughs> and the patient's sitting there, but I'm not fine. <laughs> and so, so it's, it's, it's really interesting because I think that, when we know, when we have the answer and we know the, what the cure is, then okay, there's hope, there's a clear path. And when the situation or the condition is a bit more challenging and it requires more patience and it requires multiple modalities and it requires us to admit that modern medicine just hasn't figured it out yet. We just don't understand. And it doesn't mean that everything is okay. It just means that these labs that we ran look good but we don't understand what is triggering these symptoms. And that means we need to look deeper and do the best that we can. I think that's when a lot of people, but rather than, than really focusing on what we can do and understanding that the patients and, and trial and error might need to be done, let's say with elimination diet. That's what elimination diet is. We try something for four to six weeks or a certain period of time. And then we try to identify, well, what are the triggers there in that um, of the ones that we've eliminated and we slowly start reintroducing them. And so I think that hope lies in that, in knowing that, okay, there are options, even though we don't understand everything. And in medicine, again, we, it's, we haven't quite been trained that way, but also it's, it's one of those self-selecting um, properties where we go into medicine because we want all the answers and we want to know it all. So, so I do think that recognizing limitations, but recognizing that also there's so much out there that we need to be open to. And as long as it doesn't do any harm, and as long as there's some evidence that's, that's valuable and legitimate, let's go ahead and try it. Um, and I think that could really change that that feeling and that, that opening and that hope in people rather than saying, okay, everything looks fine. I don't, I don't know what else to do. This is it. And, and then the patient goes home and they're like, well, nobody's listening to me. Um, nobody understands what I'm going through. Um, and, and there's nothing they can do. So how can you have hope if th those, th those are the messages that you're hearing, right? Oh yeah. Uh, I think, anyone with a chronic illness listening to this podcast has heard one or all of those at some point. Right. I know I have. Uh, mm -hmm. Even if they're a wonderful doctor, um, mm -hmm. some of them, some of them don't investigate. It, now, admitting when you don't know is important. And in fact, I love doctors that say that to me, mm -hmm. um, rather than be like, there is nothing or or wrongly diagnose me, like I'll still never, never get over and I won't mention their name. Mm -hmm. A doctor that twice, because I didn't realize I was seeing them years apart. I was, I was referred twice to a doctor on Park Ave who's like well known for being really good, I think for surgeries because they were a rheumatologist. Mm -hmm. um, he diagnosed me with runner's knee twice. Mm -hmm. 
And each time, and I'm like ready with my story when I walk in and I'm like, I get it's a seven minute visit. I'm going to rock this. And it's like, yeah, <laughs> you don't understand in the slightest and you don't care to understand. Yeah. Uh, and so, I, I, you know, we talked about this a little bit before. Uh, it's not good to say, um, well, put them in categories of good doctor, bad doctor, like right. way too black and white. Um, uh, but it, and but there are also different kinds of doctors, yes. right? It really, and you and that's I mean that's actually part of Wellacopia is that it's yeah. not just like going through your insurance or location just because you all learned the same thing pretty much in medical school. You are mm -hmm. still different people. You have a different outlook, a different approach to care, different personalities. You mm -hmm. are different human beings, just like we're different human beings. Exactly. Exactly. And that, I think that that relationship and that fit is very, very important because we know that outcomes do vary depending on the provider or doctor-patient relationship and that you can achieve better outcomes if there's a better fit before, between the practitioner and the patient. Um, and, you know, of course, we have to consider trust and establishing that. And, and if a doctor is not... If you feel that your doctor isn't even listening to your story, how can you possibly trust them? They could be the best specialist and they could be doing great work in maybe other areas. But if you feel that there's no connection, there's no listening, how can, how can there be trust? And so that automatically then kind of downgrades that patient's experience and that sense of hope as well as that ability to really heal if you're working with a practitioner that just where, where there's just that disconnect and also knowing that the doctor is committed to giving you the answers, you know, any, any, any doctor that that's, you know, um, kind of like, well, well, I know it all, there's no evidence and there's no, that should raise a little bit of a flag, you know? And so what, what I find, and, and I'm, you know, part of these um, networks of doctors where we discuss, complex cases and where we give each other advice. I think that any, um, you know, doctor that, that you're seeing and that, for instance, that I see, I think that one of, one of the questions that, um, that you had asked earlier was, you know, how do you, um, how do you choose your own doctor? Well, knowing that they're, that they're very active in their community, that they're constantly, that they're continuing their education, that they're constantly, um, learning from other doctors, that they're looking up research articles, that they're going to conferences. I think that that's extremely, extremely important in knowing that your doctor is growing too, and your doctor is going to look up answers that he or he may not have answers to. Um, I think that that's just, and again, that helps also build trust and hope because you know they're going to be your advocate. You know that they're committed to your care. Yeah. First of all, thanks for basically just totally validating Willacopia's mission. <laughs> so that's always nice. Um, and I don't know if you want to move into this now, but uh, I think that's really a great segue into someone we both know very well in very different ways. Oh. And that's um, Dr. Cowan, Dr. Yes. Steve Cowan. I don't know if any of you out there heard of him. He's become quite well known. Um, uh, but he is a doctor that thanks to his detective skills mm -hmm. and commitment to to needing to know the answers um, when things are a little off track. Um, he probably saved my sister's life. Um, mm -hmm. But or would you like to talk about yeah. your experience? Yeah. Absolutely, yes. So Dr. Cowan, so he's a developmental pediatrician. And um, he is, um, the way that, that I met him actually is Dr. Frank Lippman uh, recommended him. And we had this because my daughter is suffering from anxiety and selective mutism. So of course, you know, we went the traditional route in terms of some um, sort of um, in school type of therapy interventions and, um, and another intervention um, called PCIT um, that, that has to do with the kind of the way that parent and child are interacting um, and, and really providing small rewards for certain behaviors and um, incentivizing the child to learn um, certain behaviors that are, that are good 
in a sense, so for a child with anxiety, let's say in selective mutism, being able to produce speech in situations that are anxiety provoking. And for my daughter, in my daughter's case, she was completely mute in school um, until last fall, actually. And whereas on play dates, at home, wherever else we went, she was her bubbly chatterbox self, but at school completely mute to the point where we didn't know if we could keep her at the school that she was at, um, where we just really kind of felt that we weren't very much supported in, um, because of her condition. And, um, and we were told many times you should consider medications. And again, not to villainize medications because they can be very important. But in this particular case, we didn't feel that they were necessary. And we felt that there were more interventions that needed to be tried before we went down that route. And so what happened was we, she had worked with a, what we call a brave buddy. So for anyone out there that's uh, familiar with selective mutism, um, Typically, children with selective mutism don't speak in certain environments that cause anxiety. Sometimes that could be even going out of the house. They may just become completely mute. For other children, it might be only speaking with, only, they only don't speak to adults. Or, some, or for many kids, it can be the school setting. And, um, and so we had a brave buddy that would be with her during certain um, times at school that would help to encourage speech and, and kind of coach on tiny, tiny little steps. And again, we'll get back to the little steps later because I think that applies to so many different conditions and approaches because it's really in those baby steps that you achieve these giant leaps because there's no way that anyone could tell my daughter, um, okay, Olivia, if you raise your hand in front of the classroom and say the answer to, you know, I don't know, um, 17 plus five, um, you're going to get a prize or you're going to get this. There's no way that she would ever do that. But if you say, hey, Olivia, if we go and quietly go up to this teacher and tell her the answer for 17 plus five, um, let's try that. And then you're going to get, and then you go like tiny, tiny, tiny steps. And so eventually through these interventions, she actually started to produce speech. Um, and around this time is when we met Dr. Cowan. And one of the things that, other than the fact that he does magic tricks uh, for children in his office, which definitely um, helps in, in trust building, because I think for kids, really, it's, it's difficult to trust a, a, a strange adult that they see maybe once a month, and, and that is kind of asking and evaluating and asking all these questions to the parent and to the child. Um, so he started with magic tricks. And Olivia just immediately kind of eased into the, the whole thing. And she was like, I've got this. And she was chatting with him the whole time. And I just knew that he brought her into this parasympathetic dominant state because, again, selective mutism, anxiety, your sympathetic nervous system driven, you're in your fight or flight, you're fighting that tiger. And that is just how we're wired. That is, that is just what, um, what we're... I don't want to say stuck with, but what we're gifted in this life. I like that. <laughs> so we have to work with it, right? We have to work with what we have. And she was in that fight or flight a lot of the time. Well, he completely was able to say, to kind of, um, you know, hijack that, that sympathetic nervous system and say, you know, I've got just the thing for you. She went into her parasympathetic and was openly able to talk and able to engage with him and so on. And one of the things that we did with him, so he is a traditionally trained pediatrician, but he also has training in traditional Chinese medicine. Um, and as some might know, in Chinese medicine, we have these five elements through which the qi, the energy flows. And he gave a questionnaire um, to us to determine which elements might be dominant in Olivia that could help us better understand Olivia. Uh, and so she turned out to be... Um, earth and fire. Those were her dominant ones. And some of those characteristics have to do with, you know, uh, like sometimes having certain amplified physical symptoms, like a lot of stomach aches. Um, that again, that functional abdominal pain that the doctor says, you're fine. <laughs> but she really would have disabling stomach aches. Um, other things would be, again, anxiety, um, kind of difficulty trusting certain situations or people and basically feeling that you're in um, kind of like not safe in the world, unfortunately. 
And again, it could have been those very, very long hours and, and nights that I was working and my cortisol levels when, when I was pregnant with her, but who knows? But, you know, just, just feeling that, um, that, that there, there's no sense of safety. And so in this case, um, understanding, okay, well, what are my main, you know, elements in this case that guide me? And, and what are my predispositions? And I think for Olivia, intuitively, this just sort of made sense to her. She was like, yeah, mommy, I'm an earth and fire child, you know? And like, this is what I am. And this is why I act this way. And this is what I'm going to do to like, help me with this element and to help me with that. It just spoke to her. The other thing that he did that actually I'm, I'm planning to post something on this in more detail, but he, and I'd known about heart math for a very, very long time, but I hadn't used it until we walked into Dr. Cowan's office. Something I would highly, highly, highly recommend um, for anyone with symptoms of anxiety, um, panic attacks, um, any sort of um, mood symptoms that have been difficult to regulate, as well as um, even high blood pressure, actually. Sorry, what was that again? Heart? Heart math. It's called heart math. So the app is, the app is called, um, so it's uh, inner balance heart math. And what it is, it's a biofeedback tool. So you actually download the app for free on your phone. And then you purchase this um, little sensor that actually just goes on your earlobe uh, that detects your heart rate. And you plug in the sensor literally into your iPhone when the app is on. And what that does is it feeds your heart rate to the phone, to the app. And what the app does is it has a visual cue for this kind of um, circular, colorful shape um, that constricts and, um, and expands. So when it constricts, you're supposed to exhale. When it expands, you inhale. And you follow that shape. And if there's um, good, uh, um, you know, match up between what you're doing and, and what the visual cues are, you're get, gonna get into a state of, very good heart rate variability. So you're gonna see a little um, graph actually on the app that shows you your heart rate um, at various points in time. And generally, again, parasympathetic nervous system activation and being in that state of healing, getting more blood flow to the gut, being in that more rest or digest state, um, in part, heart rate variability is, is what predicts that and what tells us that, oh yeah, look, you're in that good state. Um, so usually what I see with myself or with my daughter or patients that I give this to usually, um, you know, it's not uncommon to start with a heart rate of, you know, hundred and, you know, or even, even higher than a hundred if you're just kind of a little bit in that stressed out state. Well, by the end of the session, and by the way, the session can be five minutes, it can be 30 minutes, you could be on the app as long as you want. And there are benefits, I say to people, even five minutes. If you can do five minutes a day, better than nothing. Um, but even after five minutes, you see that the heart rate has gone down nicely, and then you're getting that nice heart rate variability. So let's say the heart rate goes between um, 50 and 75 beats a minute in a nice, beautiful sinusoid wave. Um, so, so Dr. Cowan really kind of reintroduced me to that and, and showed me how easy it was that we started using it and I started using it for myself and I love um, showing it to my patients because then they really get to see it's this immediate biofeedback where you see okay what I'm doing and changing my breathing pattern and taking these deep slow breaths is actually affecting my heart I'm affecting my physiology by literally just paying attention to my breathing which can be extremely powerful because oftentimes when we feel in that helpless, hopeless state, we don't feel that we have any kind of control over our physiology, but we do. Yeah, that really goes back to um, baby steps. Yes. You were talking about, and I, and I do talk about this with others uh, on the podcast, um, mm -hmm. that I know a lot of us are in, you could say that fight or flight state with, um, with just how we feel about our illnesses. It's like yes. so acute it, for this chronic illness. It's an acute mm -hmm. um, pain that's going on um, that, you know, you don't, you don't know when it's going to end. And so it's very hard to think of the baby steps. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And I won't get into it now, but I've been having a lot, a, a lot of discussions with people with chronic illnesses about the um, 
we'll say the opioid crisis. Yes. And yeah, that's, that's a whole big topic. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah. But, um, but just how a lot of people have been saying in these Facebook groups I'm part of and run that um, they're being denied one because they might be seen as pill poppers, but it's terrible. Um, yeah. But they really just want to say that there are times where we're going to need opioids of some sort mm -hmm. to function at all, but that doesn't mean that they don't want to take care of themselves in these baby exactly. step ways. Exactly. Exactly. Like, like you said, medications are not necessarily the villain. I personally think as much as possible, you should avoid them, but you definitely yes. like shouldn't necessarily. <laughs> sometimes you can't, and sometimes for a short term, as long as you're looking for that root cause, um, it can be very helpful. I mean, for, um, you know, even just looking at, you know, uh, thyroid problems with hypothyroidism. Well, if your thyroid is extremely underactive, it would be very difficult to say no to, you know, being treated with levothyroxine, with thyroid hormone, to help correct that while you're also trying to understand what caused this autoimmune process. Am I deficient in any of the nutrients? How can I work to manage my stress, but still take the levothyroxine and don't avoid the problem and still get your energy up with the levothyroxine and avoid some of the other symptoms of hypothyroidism so that you can then with a clear mind kind of work on the triggers and hopefully make sure that you know, you're addressing those as much as possible. Or even medications for hypertension. Of course, we don't want to go to medications right away. But if someone's blood pressure is extremely high and putting a strain on the heart, yes, let's work on diet. Let's work on exercise. Let's work on stress reduction. Extremely, extremely important or nutrient supplementation. But let's also make sure that we're not going to cause excessive strain on the heart, heart failure, other complications, um, because we haven't addressed the problem because we're so avoidant. So, uh, you know, my, my motto has always been lifestyle, nutrition, the, you know, pillars of health first, but Hey, let's use these other great tools that are available if we really need them. Yeah, that's definitely always been my perspective. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what, um, integrative medicine is, right? Mm -hmm. It's integrating, yeah. um, you could say Western and Eastern or, yeah standard or allopathic and holistic, um, that neither one is right or wrong, but the combination of the two. Although, you know, if you can go au naturel, that's awesome. Of course. <laughs> it also saves yeah. you money. Um, yeah. <laughs> exactly. And yeah. prevention really, and that's why prevention really is the key. Yeah. Being aware of what habits might you have now that down the road could cause problems. Um, and working on them now rather than waiting for them to pop up and then seeking those options. Yeah. And I know that that's actually, um, so going back to Dr. Cowan, his interact, like my experience with him was actually very, well, there's two sides to this. There's one I really want to talk about his idea of functional medicine um, and developmental care for pediatrics. But also going back to, I, I should have him on the show, really. I, like, I should reach out to him. He doesn't know that I still think about him since I was a child. Um, but just to put it in a context, um, he was my pediatrician. And he was uh, just great coincidence. Uh, he was my pediatrician. He was a standard pediatrician. Uh, my mom reminded me earlier, I spoke to her, um, that he was maybe 30 years old. Like oh, right out of residence. We just started, right? Yeah. So similar to you, I, I, I'm assuming, and like I'd like to talk to him that he had somewhat of a similar journey to you, mm -hmm. which is like you went through the system. You knew there was always something that needed to be tweaked, um, mm -hmm. and, and you should look at medicine um, maybe in also a, an alternative way. Um, right. But he, the way he handled that at the time, I mean, there were two different ways. One, um, my sister was diagnosed with cat scratch fever, um, which maybe you can explain. I always kind of said um, to, to hurry it up, it's a little like rabies, <laughs> but it's not exactly, it's not rabies. So um, it's a bacterial infection, essentially. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So the very, very rare thing that uh, he discovered was that it wasn't bacterial, it mm -hmm. wasn't viral, it mm -hmm. was fungal. And she is the first case on record with fungal 
had stretch fever. Um, he actually asked my mom if he could write a paper on it in the New England Journal of Science. Medicine? Oh, Medicine. Wow. thank you. Yeah, I'm not sure if he did, actually. I should look that up. But I know that he asked about that. And the wonderful thing about his uh, involvement in this journey was that my sister had three operations. She was supposed to have one. Wow. Uh, uh, and it was in her neck. So we discovered it because she had a big lump in her neck. She spent her first birthday in hospital uh, for this reason. And he, because he was, he's a general pediatrician or was very much general at that time, he couldn't do the surgery and he couldn't get more in depth, but he would make recommendations. And, you know, to be honest about something is he made a recommend recommendation um, uh, for a doctor that actually really messed my sister up. Mm. And um, he was like, apparently heartbroken. And he took a little responsibility for that. And that's, you know, he heard he was great for other reasons, but um, because of that, Dr. Cowan um, made sure that he investigated as far as humanly possible and would not rest until um, she was okay. And, uh, you know, they found out everything they needed to about this case. Mm -hmm. And um, like, I, I don't know, I just remember that he was there for her. Like mm -hmm. he was that detective. Yeah. Yeah. My mother, Hope, who's freaking the fuck out. And <laughs> um, I mean, my sister doesn't have a trapezius oh, on her right side anymore. It's like a, oh, wow. it's in you. For those who don't know, your trapezius muscle is the largest muscle in your back. And it goes from like your shoulder all the way down your, your mid back. So that's how big her surgery was. Yeah, her surgery. Well, her surgery was just in her neck. But mm -hmm. that surgeon that messed up um, cut the nerves, I guess, oh. the details of this, to her trapezius. Mm -hmm. Um, and actually through ballet, my sister was able to build up all the muscles abnormally around there. So she's actually even uh, in her shoulder. She was not, she was like, bloop. Oh, wow. yeah. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, it just, it meant the world to us that he was mm -hmm. there. He was, he was committed. He was yeah. There. So committed. He is a perfect example of the kind of practitioners that we bring on to Wellacopia because mm -hmm. they are they are part of the journey and they care even if it's outside of their care. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why I'm so thankful for him. And clearly yes. you're very thankful for yes, him. Yes, very much, yes. <laughs> yeah, he's changed your daughter's life in a way where he looked outside the box. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and it's, it's God, beautiful uh, having, having people like you support us. Um, so, so thanks, Dr. Cowan. Yes. <laughs> I got, we got to send this. Yes. Uh, yeah. And um, we're going to see him and follow up. Actually, I'll tell him that um, right. we talked about him. Yes. Yeah. My original name was Reichenberg. You might remember it by that. That's not my last name anymore. <laughs> um, so yes, Dr. Cowan, that was uh, wonderful. Um, Actually, I would love to ask you about your involvement in nutrition because uh, mm -hmm. I've looked at your website and your social media and you are very proactive um, mm -hmm. in uh, advocating for nutrition and even putting up a lot of recipes. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's interesting. I, as, as I'm sure you know, in traditional medical education, we don't get a whole lot of uh, nutrition training. And uh, that's hopefully changing, but um, I really kind of learned more about nutrition through, well, one, through my family, through just growing up and, and the way that I grew up in Serbia really was, um, there were farmers, farmers markets every day in um, Belgrade where I lived. And I would go with my grandma when I was very, very little we would go to the farmer's market and then sample fruit and veggies and feta cheese and, you know, and be like, oh, this is good. Let's get, you know, 500 um, grams of that and let's get this. And we actually like really, like we talked to the farmers that, that you know, um, uh, that, that made this food possible for us. And my grandma would cook everything from scratch. And I think that was my, even though I obviously didn't realize it at the time, but it was interesting, you know, moving to, um, to Canada first, and then the U.S., but to Canada really first from Serbia, 
I had no idea, you know, in Belgrade at the time, we didn't have a whole lot of process. We had some, but there were maybe like three brands and everything else was just food from scratch. And there really weren't a whole lot of options. There was a lot of bread, but other than that, there weren't a whole lot of packaged goods. It really was just food that your, that your grandma or your mom makes. And, and I think that those really were kind of my fundamentals and my basics. Um, again, without really realizing it, because then when I moved over time, I was able to keep some of that. And then there were times that my diet sort of changed and didn't feel so great. And then I, and then I kind of got back on track. Um, but then after kind of, as part of this journey, um, I think to kind of build on to my, um, to this kind of naturally learned and, and, and observed kind of way of cooking and preparing food, it really was my integrative medicine fellowship, functional medicine, and just learning more about how different nutrients specifically affect our body and disease processes. Not only in extreme situations, of course, in medical school, you learn about extreme situations where, um, you know, you have to treat right away and somebody is, let's say, B12 deficient and they're having neuropathy already and, you know, um, but also dealing with the subtleties and making sure that, you know, our body has a great way of keeping things in balance. But if we're not consuming enough nutrients and now with a soil, you know, with a um, with the um, soils that, that just are depleted of nutrients, um, it's getting harder and harder. Also, a lot of people might have an issue with absorption. So we have to be mindful of, yes, our body has amazing, much more sophisticated mechanisms of keeping things in balance that we could ever understand. But sometimes our body still needs help because of these environmental things that are happening now and because of um, gut problems that, that a lot of uh, people experience. Um, so I think that that really shaped and, and, and working closely with nutritionists and health coaches um, and, and learning more about you know, the whole kind of habit change piece of everything. Because I think that in my current practice, I would say I probably see many more people who are already very, very much driven and committed to changing their habits if it's going to help with their symptoms. So I don't necessarily have to do the extra motivational type of work. Um, but it's so common. I mean, even in, even in, in just the day to day of how our schools are feeding our kids and, um, you know, the girls, I mean, I, I love the, the idea of Girl Scouts and my, my daughter is a Girl Scout. The idea of Girl Scouts is amazing and everything, but Girl Scout cookies, to read the ingredients on that. And, and so just, just kind of, um, I think as a mom and as a physician and as someone who grew up in a country at a time where it was just very basic foods that no one even, we didn't think about calories. We didn't think about um do you eat this or that? It was mostly plant-based. A lot of people ate meat. I just never really cared much for meat. Um, but it was mostly plant-based, whole foods, um, and, and, and balanced, really, where you didn't have to think about all of these different components. We live in a different world now, unfortunately. It's very, very different. And we have to, to take care. And, and one of my missions now, just, just as a mom, is to think of both creative ways of how to create some, so you mentioned some of the recipes and a lot of it, like I love to bake, but I also don't bake with, you know, um, you know, the, the regular flour and sugar. And, and I'm always looking to create recipes that are going to be nourishing and filled with flax seeds and hemp and chia seeds and nuts, um, and all of that goodness. But at the same time, um, be creative with maybe what I use to sweeten it. You know, do I use a bananas? Do I use um, a little bit of, um, I, I actually like a monk fruit sweetener and erythritol. Um, I like the Slacanto brand and that's, that's what I use. Um, and, uh, or do you, you know, or just find creative ways that, that children are going to adopt healthy habits 
despite all of this noise out there. And all of these, I mean, they're in front of my kid's school. There are these like ice cream trucks and stands and, and it just drives me crazy because um, it, it really is the path to one third of the U.S. adults having, obese, having um, diabetes by 2050 and many other issues. Um, and so, so that's one of the areas that I am very passionate about and very, um, and very much motivated to make a difference because I see what it's, you know, already it's such a huge gap between how I grew up and, and how my kids are growing up. Um, but I also just love to experiment in the kitchen and I cook with my kids. And so I love to post things that have nutritional value, but are also easy to make and, um, um, uh, and, uh, and taste good because we want to eat it still taste good. Oh yeah. I mean, I actually only, uh, cook vegetarian, actually uh, really only vegan except for eggs sometimes mm -hmm. in my house. And I'm not saying you all have to be vegan, but it has been cheaper and easier and I love it. Just putting it out there. Um, and also for those, uh, spoonies out there, um, I know that a lot of you have issues with being able to cook because you're in too much pain or you don't have, mm -hmm. or you're fatigued. Um, but first of all, if you do have someone, a support system, um, yeah. never, um, feel bad about asking for that, for that help, um, to cook for you. And you can be vocal about what you want cooked. And that can be something simple and healthy. Mm -hmm. I am happy. And I'm sure Dr. Boyana is happy to give some advice on that if you want. Um, but also when you have those spoons, <laughs> that energy, those moments where you do, um, I do highly recommend using that time when you can to cook a lot, um, and, or just like a large amount of something and putting it away in the freezer. I do that all the time now. Mm -hmm. I do it like once a week also because my husband doesn't make any food. That's a whole other issue. <laughs> um, uh, but yes. My personal advice, worth the spoons, even if that's what you do that day, it will be better for the rest of the week or, yeah. Absolutely, and you'll be able to nourish yourself, which is yeah. then going to create positive results. Absolutely, I love batch cooking, yeah. And to defrost, um, there's a few ways to do it, some better than others. You could just leave it in the fridge overnight, you could. I actually, to do it faster, sometimes is I'll get a bowl of just like warm water and yeah. use it like floating that container for half an hour and then it's fine. I was like, awesome. I didn't even put it in a microwave. <laughs> so that's great. Um, I actually, I wasn't planning on bringing this up and I know we have to kind of wrap up, but I want to talk about it because it's a sensitive topic that's mm -hmm. been coming up on a lot of the Facebook groups that, uh, that I speak on or I, that I'm part of. Um, some doctors uh, maybe a lot of doctors will say to people with these chronic illnesses, and I'm uh, mostly involved with people with fibromyalgia, so I'll, I guess let's just say for fibromyalgia, uh, they recommend that they should lose weight and they won't have pain anymore. And someone this past week even did a, um, a poll asking what everyone's weight is or like what weight oh, range they're okay. in, and if they're un or rather if they're underweight, overweight, obese, yeah whatever, normal weight. Um, and yeah, people are really up in arms because they're like, yeah, they told me this as well. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm like, you know, a normal weight, I'm a normal weight. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, I decided to chime in. And mm -hmm. I was like, look, I completely understand the frustration by that. And I, oh, sorry. And a lot of them said I lost weight and it didn't change anything. Mm -hmm. A lot of them said that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I was like, look, that, is absolutely valid because it is not just a weight thing. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the thing with fibromyalgia and a lot of chronic illnesses is that we don't know what the cause is or, or also what could help. And mm -hmm. there are countless stories of how nutrition and probably therefore weight loss can help diminish symptoms, sometimes even put people in, I guess you could say remission. I happen to be one of those people which is why I, I luckily don't need to see much in the way of practitioners right now. And I'm not in medication. I'm a nutritionist and I'm not perfect by any means, but I None know that are, yeah. <laughs> I'm not perfect. Um, when I don't eat well, and it's not like I'm without pain, um, but when I don't eat well, mm -hmm. when I wait, things are worse. Yeah. Absolutely. And so I just want to put it out there for everyone. And I would love to hear mm -hmm. what you have to say about this, that in my opinion, um, 
if you are overweight, obviously not if you, if you don't need to lose weight, do not lose weight <laughs> um, mm-hmm. or if it would be unhealthy for you too, but it may be something that helps, but it's not losing weight. It's eating what's right for your body. Like, yeah. you, like you were saying. Um, but yeah, I totally get it. If people are pissed when a doctor is like, just lose weight, you'll be fine. Wait, you'll be fine. <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah, no, I'm sure there's, there's nothing more frustrating than that. I think that, well, it's interesting you mentioned that actually, and, and we hadn't spoken about this, um, uh, you and I, before we started recording, but uh, I definitely, I mean, I can say as a, you know, person with no fibromyalgia, I have joint aches if I eat excess sugar, if I eat excess gluten, I, my body notices it. So I can only imagine how much these symptoms can be amplified in someone who has fibromyalgia. Um, Again, I don't know of specific studies looking at weight loss and fibromyalgia or specific diets and fibromyalgia, but what I tell most of my patients, and I really work, so part of it is really kind of as, as, a, as a physician, meeting people where they are, and then the other piece is talking about, okay, well, if we don't change things, how do you think you're going to feel? Versus if we do change things, what are, what are your hopes or, or your goals or, or what do you think? is going to happen. So if we talk about any sort of dietary changes, um, again, depending on where somebody is starting, they could already be having a very clean diet. And then we might have to, to tap into, okay, well, it's probably not your diet. There still could be something that's irritating that we just don't know. But then we also look at, well, let's, let's look at stress. Let's look at the, your kind of emotional landscape and your environment. And um, or other toxins that you might be exposed to. Um, but when it comes to nutrition itself, I generally um, recommend that people eat a plant-based diet. doesn't necessarily have to be a vegan diet. Um, and if they are eating meat, um, make sure that it's well-sourced meat um, or fish and, um, and no sugar. I mean, I think just cutting out sugar completely. Yeah. For some people, it helps to cut out gluten. Um, for other people, it helps to cut out grains completely. So I do, we do sometimes, we'll do elimination diet protocols that slightly vary, and then we'll remove some of the usual suspects. Um, sometimes we'll do an autoimmune protocol um, where, there, where other food groups are eliminated. But I will say that I'm very cautious about eliminating too many food groups because then again, we might run into the issue of nutrient deficiency um, and so on. So these protocols, we really monitor patients over a period of time. Um, and then again, slowly start to reintroduce certain foods. Um, and then the foods that are kind of no brainers, um, we just want to eliminate them for good. So whether it's sugar, alcohol, again, for some people, it could be gluten. For some people, it could be with arthritis. This is really more kind of for inflammatory arthritis, but nightshades. Some people might be irritated by nightshades. For other people, it may not make a difference. So again, a lot of this is, as I kind of stated earlier, a little bit of trial and error because it's really the person with a condition that's an expert at their body. And then there are certain things that we want to remove or at least minimize, you know, remove dairy, remove sugar, um, remove gluten, see how you feel with these things. Some people might need to remove soy, um, see how you feel with these things and then experiment and slowly start to add certain things back but not the not the sugar definitely (laughs) yeah actually i recently went through something kind of bizarre Mm -hmm. um i was i realized that for like at least a month i was having a lot more to be honest gas my Mm -hmm. but like my air was filling up with Mm -hmm. sorry my belly was filling up with air and it was very painful you know distension um and i didn't know why it was getting worse and then at Passover, actually, um, like a couple months ago, uh, a part of the ritual is that you eat a bitter herb and mm-hmm. they didn't have any. So they gave us onions and I ate a bite of an onion and immediately started to fill up with air. And I was like, I know what this is. This is probably a FODMAP issue, which really mm-hmm. sucks, by the way. Mm-hmm. And that's like, um, are you on a low FODMAPs diet now? So I'll explain. So this is really bizarre. Mm-hmm. Um, so low FODMAP, first of all, FODMAPs, how do I explain them? They're um, different kinds of sugars, like fermentable sugars, like oligo and diamonosaccharides. Um, and um, like they can be really nutritious foods, but the 
the fermentation process uh, can be can really be very sensitive to your digestive system. So that yeah. could be like cabbage and and onions and garlic. Exactly. And I'm like mostly vegan. How is this going to? How is this going to work? Right. Um, and then I, I think I started to notice, I think by accident in those and didn't get reactions. So I did a huge elimination and I was like, this is bad because you talked about nutrient deficiencies, low FODMAP mm -hmm. diets, because it takes out actually like a lot of healthy things. It does. Yeah. And uh, be kind of dangerous. And then long story short, somehow we whittled down what it was and I couldn't believe what it was. It's okay. apples. Yeah. I was astonished. Yeah. <laughs> and I love apples and every single morning, it's the only thing I like always eat, or at least during the week is I make oatmeal, uh, mm -hmm. and with almond milk and chia seeds and I stew apples every, um, every Sunday, which by the way, is like super easy. If other people want to do it, it happened to not be good for me. Um, and I just stopped using apples. Now I use like blueberries um, and I don't have the issue fun. anymore. I was like, you yeah, were able crazy. to identify the one thing without removing everything from your yeah. diet. And yeah. So I thought about like, what do I eat a lot of like mm -hmm. every day that I think is good for me? Um, and then that's how I did it. Anyway, okay. it's just an anecdote yeah. of how like, you never know. <laughs> yes, it's true. It's true. You know, yeah, but, and there might be a time that you could reintroduce the apples, you know, down yeah. the road. But well, yeah. Things change. I mean, yeah. I've had apples my whole life. Yeah. Um, I'm a, I'm a big Apple fan, so yeah. bizarre. Um, anyway, we do have to wrap up. I don't want to. Um, there's so many things I feel like we didn't even talk about, and and you know that could always mean we do an additional. Yes. Um, but uh, I would like to end with, I guess the main message, if you could you can find one <laughs> main message mm -hmm. to to leave everyone with. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, so. I would, I would say, and I would really kind of go back to that, um, to talking about critical points in our lives and talk, talking about transformative experiences and, and that going from, from that state of, of hopelessness to hope. Um, one of the things that I think makes a big difference to people is knowing that although there are a number of factors we can't control, there are some things that we can control. And whether this is through mindfulness-based stress reduction, through another form of meditation practice, through therapy, through EFT tapping, there's so many modalities that I wish we had like more time to actually dive deeper into and talk about acupuncture, um, but, but whatever the modality is, self-examination, talking to friends, journaling, whatever the modality is, I think that looking within, relating to yourself, and, and knowing that no matter what, I can rely on myself, and there are things that I can control, and there are things that I um, absolutely have full control over, even though there are many aspects over there, um, that I just simply cannot exert influence over. And even those things that are beyond more my control, I completely control how I respond to them. And I think that's a big thing, again, when we talk about any really condition, we know that um, the majority of conditions are in one way or another related to stress. And I remember that before, again, before going into integrative and functional medicine, when I really was seeing just such a broad kind of spectrum of people with a number of different conditions, ranging in different levels of acuity and, um, uh, and severity, I found that the, the patients who kind of had the most challenging problems were the ones who still kind of needed to, to kind of do a little bit more um, exploration into what are some of the non-physical um, elements or aspects of their experience or their condition. So I would just kind of leave with that because I think it's, it's important that we address it as physicians or other providers. And I think that for patients, when we all go into our doctor's offices or our chiropractors or our therapists, to keep in mind that it's really, there, there's, 
yes, externally, there are a lot of factors that can help us heal, but we are really the ones where it starts. We start the healing process and there's still a lot that we can do even when it seems that many things are out of control or not well understood or not being yet addressed. You're speaking to my heart. <laughs> Couldn't agree more. Thank you so much for sharing everything you have today. As expected, this was <laughs> a tremendous pleasure. Um, and we'll be talking again soon, I'm sure. Yes. A lovely Friday. It's beautiful here. I don't know about in New York City, but it's beautiful here in Rochester. It's a nice, it's a nice day here too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this was such a pleasure. Thank you so much. This was wonderful. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Bye. And that's a wrap on another episode of Invisible Not Broken. Thank you guys for listening so much. I also want to thank you for something that's been happening behind the scenes. Dozens of you have been reaching out to me, whether it be through Wellacopia or off Wellacopia, wanting to support our mission of matching people with chronic illnesses to their ideal practitioners. Whether that be providing your trusted referrals of doctors, uh, contributing unique content, uh, peer support one-on-one -on -one to new users, the fact that you guys are so interested in making sure that Wellacopia's mission comes to fruition, I cannot tell you how heartwarming it has been. It's been fueling me every day to keep going and frankly, been giving me some spoons. Uh, for those of you who don't know the Spoonie Theory, I highly recommend you look it up. <laughs> uh, anyway, I just wanna say thank you again. If you guys haven't reached out to me personally and maybe just wanna get to know one another, please do. I'll leave my email and contact number in the show notes. Love you all so much. And as always, be kind, be gentle, and be friggin' badass. <laughs>